welcome back to False Dichotomies. I'm Cy Castells. I'm Daria Quinn. And today we're going to be trying our heart, our best to record this episode around construction noises in the hallway. Yes, uh, they are modernizing the elevators in my building, and today is the day they decided to bring out the really loud, heavy equipment. Yep, and they're pretty much right outside the door here, so... Well, that, that's the thing is that we were getting this while we were in the elevator. We actually had to go and pick up uh, a, a second U.S. USB port yeah. because we had um, misplaced the previous one. <laughs> yeah, so we've been having some production difficulties. We hope you'll be patient with us. This is not the first time that that um, our audio quality has suffered for some reason. So today we are talking about everything. Everything <laughs> is a philosophical video game. Yes. Where you have the ability to be everything in the game. And um, theoretically, everything in the universe, but of yeah. course, it's yeah. limited. It's, so <laughs> it's but it's a self-aware enough game mm -hmm. that it's transparent about. It does not pretend to be to take place in the real world, mm -hmm. but it takes place in a very vivid world that has enough resemblance to our wor world that we can uh, try to apply the mm -hmm. ideas in the game to our everyday life if we choose to. Right. And in that way, I think it's a, uh, a powerful tool for teaching certain concepts like empathy mm -hmm. and imagination and unlearning the things you think you know about being a person in the world. Right. It's all accompanied by lectures or bits of lectures from a philosopher known as Alan Watts really accompany the gameplay in a way that complements and enhances it mm -hmm. while also giving a really powerful uh, message about the nature of reality and perception and identity. Here's the, th here's the thing. I don't remember where I learned about this game. I, <laughs> the place I thought I had learned about this game, it turns out that that has nothing to do with it. So I was like, wait a minute. So where did I learn about this game? I just remember at some point learning that there was a game called Everything that I would enjoy playing. Mm -hmm. And then I found it on Steam now I love it, absolutely, <laughs> and um, it, I think it's revolutionary, and um, if you are at all curious about what video games are capable of in terms of being an art form with mm -hmm. real potential for meaning, try everything. So everything is, um, is a video game with very little structure to it. There, there is no... Uh, I, I think the average video game is about achieving a goal. You mm -hmm. want to defeat a level, you want to solve a puzzle, you mm -hmm. want to defeat a boss, you want to save a princess, you want yeah. to get from point A to point B. Yeah. Everywhere you, like advance through levels that are mm -hmm. that are arranged in some linear fashion. Yeah. Where there is really only one you could say goal in everything. And I, I believe we will get into that a little bit later, but um, you start off the game as uh, something. I believe I start off as like a rabbit or something. Yeah, it's. Um, I think it's pretty much random which animal, and I believe it's usually an animal you start as. Mm -hmm. The first time I played, I began as no copy, um, and I've started the game at least three times mm -hmm. um, just because I wanted to see what variations it can start with. There's no definitive start point, mm -hmm. really. It's a roll of the dice. And there's also no definitive end point either. And in that way, that that is also a an interesting philosophical choice mm -hmm. and an interesting artistic choice because there is a certain philosophy espoused by games that have very linear, progressive um, structure. Mm -hmm where there is a definitive start and a definitive end, and there are goals, and there are there are checkpoints, and, and there is a certain way you're supposed to do it. This game is completely free mm -hmm. of that. You have the ability to choose your own goals and your own path. So the um, you, you start off as an animal, and you are next to a gold theme. <laughs> Yep. which they call the Golden Gate. Yeah, it's 
shaped more like a jack, I guess. A, a three, a, an, an X butt with three dimensions. Yeah, it, it, it is uh, certainly a science fiction-y thingy. Yeah. <laughs> So you uh, traverse the area which you are in. You learn how to cha- how to rise and lower your consciousness into other creatures, yeah. other plants, animals, mm-hmm. objects. Uh, you can learn how to go microscopic, subatomic, mm-hmm. and then from subatomic you can go all the way up to galactic and then back again. It's an endless loop. Yeah, and and like this, the functionality of like becoming and being other things Mm -hmm. is I think the core mechanic of this game it's you're not meant to spend the game in one form Mm -hmm. you're not it's not like a goal to find what your favorite form is and stick with it whereas in a lot of games where where there's the option of playing as multiple different kinds of things you're Mm -hmm. expected to just pick one and stick with it right like with RPGs you pick a class and you pick a race and you stick with it and and if you change you lose progress, basically. Mm -hmm. Whereas this game encourages you to try different things. And um, it really, like, it's one of the many ways in which this game just pushes against the established trends of video game design. Mm -hmm. You get to theoretically experience every potential level of of existence. Mm -hmm. Again, you can go subatomic and it is... Yeah, sort of this head trip. Uh, I, yeah, the subatomic level is like there are particles there. There's mm-hmm. you can be an electron, you can be a proton, you can be an atom. Mm-hmm. Actually, the atoms are a little bit above that level, but you get the point. Like right. you get to be these little, but you also get to be mathematical concepts and mm-hmm. constants. You get to be the Planck length. Yeah, you get to be the Higgs boson. You get to be. A sphere. You get to be a dodecahedron. Mm-hmm. You get to be all of these like, and there are visual and auditory representations mm-hmm. of those that are like they're not meant to be like literal representations. It's mm-hmm. not supposed to look like a proton or look like a Higgs boson or whatever. Mm-hmm. They are artistic renderings of what that seems like. Mm-hmm based on what we know of it well and and like sort of like a an artist's rendition of something that cannot be seen and that's pretty rad it's so abstract to look at but also the music is some mm-hmm. of the best so yeah one of the my favorite things about the game is the sound design mm-hmm. it the the music will tend to come in and out mm-hmm. um it will it will be quiet for a while as you explore a space, but then the music will start up and it will like merge with the like visuals in a way that can really produce something gorgeous. Mm-hmm. And um, and that brings me to one of my favorite things to do in the game, and that is dancing, because it's not just about you know being an object or or an mm-hmm. animal and wandering around the space you can also interact with other things in Mm -hmm. the space and one of the ways you can do that is you can join with others of your kind and dance Mm -hmm. and everything in everything dances this is not something specific to animals Mm -hmm. or living things trees dance rocks dance shells dance Mm -hmm. atoms dance Particles dance, stars dance, galaxies Galaxies dance in this game, and sing. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. Everything sings, and everything dances, and everything can join with others of its kind. And Um, at one point in the game, too, you you can start bonding with everything. Yes. So, you know, you're... you're, uh, Something I did, especially after I got through all the lectures, and I realized, okay, I'm... Let me see how much of this stuff I can find. Mm-hmm. I eventually got to 96% completion before I was just like, before I just kind of gave up. Yeah. It's like, I'm looking for viruses and particles at this point, and those things are so difficult to find. Yeah. But what I would do is I would um, I would become a tree, mm-hmm. I'd grow it to as large as possible, and I would start descending on everything that had a, la- a rainbow circle around it. Mm. And when I couldn't do that... I would become an object and just try to bond with everything around me until 
I theoretically bonded with everything possible around me. Yeah. And then I would phase it out of existence and keep going. Because the goal for me, I gave myself the goal of finding everything. And like, and that's a goal that you weren't given. Yes. Again, what I like about this game is that it, it frees you to either come up with a goal and pursue it on your own Mm -hmm. or to just wander and like follow your instincts wherever it leads, which is how I generally Mm -hmm. play. I will tend to play everything when I just need to relax. Yeah. And I can't stop thinking, so it's not like just turning on a mindless YouTube video is going to help. I Mm -hmm. need to do something with my brain. Mm -hmm. So I go into this game and I just explore an environment where Mm -hmm. there's not really anything you can do wrong. There's nothing you can do to hurt yourself or others. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing I like about this game. Nothing dies. Nothing gets hurt. There is never any like conflict in the game you can join with Mm -hmm. and like join forces with other Mm -hmm. other things but the opposite of that is just leaving them alone to their own Mm -hmm. devices you don't there's no antagonism yeah which is another like huge departure from the conventions of Mm -hmm. the medium yeah now that is not to say that crazy things do not happen Oh yeah, something Tell that, me about the Mastodons. So, so something <laughs> I learned um, about a couple hours into the game was that if I had a gaggle of, say, Mastodons mm-hmm. and made as many as I could, I could, you know, because you can mm-hmm. produce as many yeah. stuff. There's a limit how many you can, you can produce of something, but you can do that. And then you grow them to as large as possible, and then you make them dance. You can end the world. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about disasters, though, because disasters are something that happens when your frame rates are messed up. Yeah. And for you for you and your computer, it took a herd of mastod- mastodons at their largest mm-hmm. size. For me, my computer, when I started the game, was uh, weak enough that I would just get random disasters just wandering around the space. Ooh. But that's the thing. Neither of those is necessarily... A bad thing mm-hmm. because the disasters themselves are kind of fun. What what happens during a z- disaster is like the screen will freeze and there will be a sound and an animation and a message on the screen saying "world destroyed by" and then whatever randomly generated disaster mm-hmm. the computer chose for you. And it could be um, the. I haven't been able to find a list of the disasters online because apparently if you if you search video game everything disasters in any combination Mm -hmm. you will get so many different results right (laughs) but um some of the ones that i have noticed in in the game are slow erosion of confidence being too awake boredom (laughs) missing assets no way mirror the search for answers self-pity and my personal favorite copyright infringement (laughs) these are things that destroy the world and a couple of them that i came across that you didn't list um everybody said the safe word at the same time oh uh people apologize too much oh oh, no (laughs) When I found out that I could do that, and I kind of figured out it was the frame rate, I just started doing it over and over yeah. again to see how many, uh, how many different ways, the crazy ways mm-hmm. the world could be destroyed. And this is why you don't give me godlike power, <laughs> <laughs> because I will rampage your city with giant tardigrades <laughs> in order to see how you all die. <laughs> But it's okay, because as soon as the frame rates cut, catch back up, it's, it's fine. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I did it on a city continent enough times that it basically wiped out everything in the city. Hmm. Like. Okay. Well. <laughs> um, like, there was literally, it was like, literally, like, tardigrades and garbage. But, like, um, the, the fact that, like. I, I encountered the disasters just as the nat- like mm-hmm. a natural result of like my computer being junk. And like what I found was that like with most games, 
if I shut down and restart my computer and open no other apps, mm -hmm. then most games will run better anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's true of everything as well. I get fewer disasters when I do that. But when I was trying to find a list of all the disasters, because I did not want to go through and play until I found them all, I found a forum post by someone who apparently they had a particularly powerful computer and they were they wanted to, to, to see what the disasters were. And they were like asking people on there, how do I make the computer <laughs> not work so well so I can get disasters? <laughs> so what that says to me is that um, one of the things that everything does very well and that when you look at other video games that are considered great, mm -hmm. they also do this well. And that is they work well within the limits of the medium. One of the limits of the video game's medium is that it depends on memory and processing speed. Mm -hmm. If you do not have those in adequate quantities for the game that you're playing, you're not going to be able to play. Right. And that's a disaster for like a literal disaster mm. for people who want to make good video games because they're like, I want this vivid, detailed world, but most computers are not going to be able to render it fully, so we need to find ways around that. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that everything does that, in addition to making these disasters be a feature <laughs> rather mm -hmm. than, than a bug, is they have extremely simplified animation where animals will roll mm -hmm. instead of walking. Like, you will have a horse, like, rolling nose over tail yeah, instead of walking the way you would expect a horse to do. And that can be really difficult to get used to at first but oh, after yeah. a while it's just charming it's yeah. like part of the it's part of the aesthetic mm. that like it encourages you to think of animals and plants not as like fundamentally different because mm. one can move and the other can't because in this game they both move in exactly the same like not exactly the same way but mm. they are just as mobile as mm. each other which sort of gets us used to thinking of the world in less in terms of divisions oh what what can move and what can't what can move what can walk and what can swim mm -hmm. because everything is capable of moving so that's two examples of how this game took their the limitations of like being being completely dependent on the power of the individual computer running it mm -hmm. and turn them into ways to further their message that reminds me of like like one of the most iconic possibly the most iconic video game characters of all time mm -hmm. is mario and mario's visual look was designed so that it could be rendered in as few pixels as possible mm -hmm. like the reason he has a mustache Mm -hmm. is because that's a really easy way to make a face like rendered with like five or six pixels mm -hmm. look distinctive. Right. And and same goes for the overalls mm -hmm. and the hat. It's like everything uh, that is iconic about Mario is in the interest of making him vi take up very, very little space on the disc. Yes. So we have this game that... Uh tries to make the best of what it has, mm -hmm. uh, and I feel it, it, ex it succeeds in that matter because it does try to replicate as much of everything as one can think of and not get lost. Yeah. Yeah, somehow it remains cohesive and consistent despite being so expansive. I mean, you can go microscopic and you can find particles, you can find... Uh, tardigrades yeah um you know hairs um snowflakes individual yeah. snowflakes <laughs> i i and like man-made objects too mm. they and they show up in the weirdest places oh, like yeah. like you could like you could be like in a in a forest and there's no sign of humanity anywhere and then you zoom down and you become a blade of grass or a rock and then suddenly you like oh there's a penny on the ground yeah and you become a penny it's like that's funny this is the first sign of human human uh, existence I've seen here, but then what I realized is that there are no humans in the game. Yeah, that, but that there is... are human-made objects. Mm. There are entire cities. Yeah, 
when when you're in like the cities, like everything there hmm. is like you get pop cans, you get like literally what one one time um I was so overjoyed when I was in the, in a, in a city and I found and became a turd. Like yeah, I, I found that too. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, and and like, and it was called a turd. And I was like, oh my god, I am so happy. And I and then I became one of the and then I went became one of the flies buzzing around the turd. And it was it was like it was poetry. And the but there's all this evidence of humanity without humans, and I think that's another thing that I think that's another choice that the game made because. Mm-hmm. Human beings are part of the world, right? But I think we are too close to being human, you know, because we're human. Mm-hmm. Last I checked, that I think if we are playing a video game where we had the option to play as human, then it would take away from I think what the point of this game is, which mm-hmm. is to try being something else, right? So this is a game that knows it's being played by a human, Mm -hmm. but it's encouraging us to try to imagine being something else. So being human is not an option. Right. And that's one of the few options that is denied to us in this, in this game. And it's not really one that we miss because we can be a, be a, be a human in almost every other video game Mm -hmm. in the world. Oh yeah. I don't think we really miss We're we're humans in reality. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) this game allows us to be everything, including God. Mm-hmm. And I think it's interesting, too, is because everything has its own thoughts. Mm-hmm. And it seems to present itself in the way that uh, a lot of people look at reincarnation. Yeah. So, um, especially when you get stuck inside the Golden Gate, which is mm-hmm. maybe the one goal in the yeah. entire game, is uh, you, you do basically a tutorial, and then it, it, the game tells you, hey, uh, go back to where you started and find the Golden Gate. You can go into it now. Yeah. And, so then, you, and then you go into it, and it kind of sucks. <laughs> Listen you, first. You, you go into it, and you kind of realize it's sort of an existential hell. Yeah. Because everything in it is lamenting about what they did, what they did wrong in their life. They missed their family. They mm-hmm. didn't treat their spouse right. They uh, they uh, chased wealth and accumulated goods instead of people. You know, and it was just this really. When I was in there, I'm like, "Am I in hell? Is this supposed to be hell?" And maybe, it, and maybe it is. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. I I kind of had that feeling too when I was there. I was and and like it's a very desolate place. There's mm-hmm. like, there's like bones lying around. Mm-hmm. There's like broken objects. There's in the rest of the game, it kind of makes sense where things are put. Mm-hmm. It's like trees will be growing in the, out of the ground and animals will be walking on the ground whereas in this place everything is just sort of there yeah and it doesn't really make any sense yeah. and not only are you in this hellscape you can't get out yeah. and the game's like you, you you're like okay try to rise out you're stuck here forever and it's when i saw that message i'm like did this game just troll me yeah, I I felt that way as well, and it took me a while to figure out like, okay, so for one for one thing, you have to clear your mind. That's the other thing, and this is some this is something that uh, an interesting visual representation of like actually clearing your mind in mm-hmm. real life, which is you collect thoughts as you explore the world. You after a while, you start to generate your own thoughts, mm-hmm. and your the thoughts that you generate are usually remixes of the thoughts that you have collected from others. Right. And that's not something that I've ever seen portrayed so literally, mm-hmm. but I think it's true about real life because we learn our ideas from other people. Right. And yes, we do think for ourselves, but we don't really begin to think for ourselves until we've had enough raw material fed into our brains mm-hmm. by outside sources. I know that because the, I remember the day when I realized that I disagreed with my parents on stuff, and I was mm-hmm. like, oh, shit. I think I just <laughs> learned to fit, fit to, to think for myself. Well, this sucks. Yeah. <laughs> now I don't know anything. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a rough day. And now I'm like... God, I'm really glad I think for myself because my parents are wrong about a lot of things, but but I love them. But in this game, like, eventually those thoughts become toxic and you have to learn how to clear them out. Mm-hmm. 
And that's another thing that we eventually have to learn in real life as well. Right. If we're going to progress to a healthier and more complete way of being in the world right. is but we need to learn how to take the stuff out of our brain that is hurting it. Right. And so that's something you have to do in order to escape from this hell. So how do you clear your mind? Well, first of all, you have to descend a lot until you find a, an unknown planet in the Golden Gate. And you descend into this unknown planet and there are broken alphabet letters. There are random geographic and ge geologic, um, geometric, the words were shapes. not coming. But, you know, shapes and shit, and you just, like, you have to keep descending until you find the programmer. And when you find the programmer, the programmer teaches you how to clear your mind, which is you go into your uh, thought menu, mm -hmm. and you hold, uh, for the PlayStation 4, you hold circle. Mm -hmm. And I believe in the PC version, it's, you said it was X? I don't know. I can't remember now. That's the thing. So, but you can't do that without finding the programmer which is something I also learned the hard way, yeah. was, okay, so I found out, okay, circle... Well, actually, when I asked you about it, you said X, so I just held on to X forever, and I'm like, this isn't working. So then I went to an, FA, into an FAQ, and they're like, oh, no, you got to keep descending until you find the programmer, and then, mm -hmm. like... So I think I spent about three hours in hell <laughs> because yeah. I really just was that lost. Actually, no, it probably wasn't. It was probably more like an hour. I'm exaggerating. There's, it's, if I, I, when you're in hell, it always seems longer. Yeah, but it, it's like it was way longer than I probably should have ever been there. And that's because I had no idea what to do until I looked this stuff up. Because it, the game does not tell you that you're... When, yeah. when the game says, hey, you can go... In, hey, uh, go into the gate now. It doesn't tell you you're going to be stuck there. Well, but, to an extent, the game understands that the best way to learn something is to go through it. Yeah, that's that's actually reminds me of another game that I'm playing right now that I will probably put on the list once I once I'm done with it. Um, that is another philosophical game. Okay, and it's called Getting Over It with Bennett Foddy. Okay, have you heard of it? Yep. It's actually de designed by the creator of Quop. Never heard of that one. Okay, either. in Quop, you play as a runner and you control the upper legs and lower legs individually with individual buttons, which is so hard <laughs> because you have to think about, okay, I need to move my right leg forward, but oh, oh, I lifted it off the ground, so I'm gonna, gonna, gonna tilt backwards now, and now, oh, no, I fell, you know? That sounds incredibly it frustrating. It is extremely frustrating. So after the st stunning success of Quop, this was successful. Oh, it was successful because um, people would like I mean, make, would make YouTube videos of themselves playing it, and it kind of went viral in that way. See, this this sounds like a game that's this to me. It sounds like a game that would show up on the Angry Video Game Nerd. Oh, probably. And he'd probably you know he'd probably call it like a pile of fucking bullshit. And... Yeah. Well, <laughs> after this game, after creating this game, Bennett Foddy created mm -hmm. Getting Over It with Bennett Foddy, which is you play as a guy stuck in a in a pewter cauldron. Okay. So he has no use of his legs. But he does have a great big hammer, which he can swing around and use to pull oh, himself okay. along I, I, the I've ground seen, or up over I've obstacles. seen this. I've seen people mm -hmm. play this online, and that, that looks just as frustrating as... Yeah. I, I guess this guy enjoys making very frustrating well, games. Well, here's the thing. It's, a, again, I, uh, this is another philosophical game. And this game is about frustration. And it's about challenging yourself. Okay. And the the reason it's getting over it with Bennett Foddy instead of just getting over it is that it comes with recordings of him telling you uh, why he made the game and uh, what inspired it. And whenever you fall and lose a lot of progress, he will say some something inspirational to help you like get the strength to, to keep going okay and there and that's just one of the ways that it's like structured in a way that helps you get used to the process of trying failing and trying again mm -hmm. 
that I don't think you could possibly learn any other way than just by going through it. Right. And that's why I think games have potential as an art form Mm -hmm. that goes far beyond like most other art forms because it can give you an experience. Mm -hmm. It can put you actually in the situation that, um, that a character is in in a way that just reading about that character or watching a movie about that character just will never, Mm -hmm. like, feel that real to you. And that's, like, why I think everything succeeds so well is because it gives you an easier way, an easier way to, like, imagine living as a tree or a rock or uh, or a star Mm -hmm. or a satellite. That's another thing I love to be when when I'm in the solar system level mm-hmm. as a satellite. It's like, oh, what's this tiny object over here? Oh, this is a satellite. It's a specific satellite mm-hmm. that that NASA sent up at some point oh, in yeah. history. It's like, and look, no one has actually seen this satellite with their eyes in decades, and here I am being it. <laughs> so it's like, it, it, yeah, it's it's like in so in the way that. Uh, getting over it with Bennett Foddy is about frustration. Everything is about empathy mm-hmm. and imagination mm-hmm. in a way that, like, just will not work in any other medium. Mm-hmm. So uh, throughout this game, we get these uh, pieces of uh, pieces of a dude's TED Talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if it's a TED Talk, <laughs> but it definitely has the <laughs> TED Talk vibe to it. Yeah. So Alan Watts um, is a philosopher. Uh, his philosophy tends to like attempt to merge Eastern and Western thought. Mm-hmm. And in the bits that of his lectures that are in this game, he talks a lot about um, again unlearning the divisions we put up in our mind between ourselves and other things. Like, he talks about how it's kind of arbitrary how we consider ourselves as ending with our skin, and how there's no real fundamental separation between mm-hmm. yourself and the world around you. And that's, like, something that also I've, I've, uh, I've encountered in, like, seeing people talk about the philosophy of um, environmentalism, mm-hmm. which is more than just, like this moral imperative to care for the rocks and the trees and shit. Right. But it is actually recognizing that we are part of the environment. Mm-hmm. That we're not... There isn't, like, humanity and nature and a sharp division between them. We right. are nature, and nature is us. And so when we care about nature, mm-hmm. it is not selfless. Like, if we don't start caring about the environment, we will die within a few years, mm-hmm. It's uh, it's been predicted. And a lot of people are already dying because of that. Yeah. So, like, it's not just a theoretical, like, abstract distinction. It's a very real um, thing that is, that if we don't start changing the way we think about the world, then we will be destroyed. And I think that when Alan Watts is, when you're like playing this game and you are jumping from animal to plant to rock to continent to stars Mm -hmm. to microbes, and, and all the time Alan Watts is talking about the fundamental fluidity of identity and separation there, one of the one of the lectures is titled "There are no such things as things," mm-hmm. because what we think of as things, there is no real division between them, mm-hmm. other than what we have decided is the division, and we can decide to change those divisions. Right. Um, sort of like in the way that like race is only real to the extent that racists believe it is. Right. Or gender is only real to the point that we, like, categorize people according to it. Right. So it's, it really just, like, gives you pause to think about 
what sort of divisions am I holding on to that are keeping me from looking at the world in a more accurate way? Yeah. And to go about uh, go back to the point about how there are no humans in the in the game, yeah. and what I was saying about how it seems to represent a a version of um, reincarnation. Mm -hmm. I think humans are in the game. And they're just other souls like you who are passing through every other object. Oh. It's kind of like the Force in that sense. Nice. In, in the sense that, um, at least as it was told to us originally by Yoda in the original trilogy, uh, the Force is the spirit of everything connected to one another. And that we all have te that we all have access to the force. Mm. Now, of course, you know, binds, the, f the f it binds the universe together like yeah. duct tape. Well, not, <laughs> like duct tape, no. But <laughs> but the the idea was that <clears throat> the idea, or at least the idea that I'm getting from this, is that we are everything, mm. and everything is us. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. They, um, another. Uh, title of one of the lectures is uh, a universe that peoples meaning that people are an action that the universe undertakes mm -hmm. um, and he also makes a uh, uh, metaphor of waves like there is no separation between the ocean and the wave mm -hmm. because the ocean is waving well in the same way the universe peoples and that's, I think, a decent explanation for why you see man-made objects, but you don't see people. Mm -hmm. Because the creations of humanity are just as much a, a, a result of natural processes as mm -hmm. rocks and beehives and turds. Mm -hmm. Because we were created by nature, and we created these things. So, ergo, nature created these things. So, with this all pointed out, what is the purpose of everything? My take on it is that it is a game meant to remind you of something you probably already intrinsically know mm -hmm. on a subconscious level, which is that we are connected mm -hmm. to everything. And every, I'm going to be. I'm going to reference a Miley Cyrus song. All right, <laughs> uh, Miley, Miley Cyrus uh, during her um, "Oh My God, Is She Completely Gone Mad" phase, uh, recorded an album with the Flaming Lips hmm. called "Miley Cyrus and Her Dead Pets." Okay, which is what you would expect Miley Cyrus and the Flaming Lips to sound like. And in a song, I have called, to check this out. <laughs> in a song called "Do It." Um, feels like I'm part of the universe and it's part of me. Mm, yep. And this is coming from someone who a lot of people at the time was considering she was going completely out of her mind. It sounds like she had a moment of clarity. Um, that, that has been my... I remember being in the beginning of that Miley Black backlash when you know she started to really go into that um, I don't know what phase we would call that the uh, the post Hannah Montana years and a lot of people thought she was going crazy and I was kind of on that wave for a while but I have come around in like the last two years to realize two things one she was exploring what it meant to be Miley Cyrus mm -hmm. that journey was done very publicly mm -hmm. and those kind of journeys are often messy and this was a this was a person who had been famous from childhood. Yes. And who whose family and managers had capitalized on that fame mm -hmm. from childhood. Right. She was, before she was an adult, she was a commodity. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's the case for a lot of especially girls and women mm -hmm. in, in this world. Mm -hmm. um, although it's definitely easier to see with like the very famous people. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you actually see a similar trajectory with Alanis Morissette. Yes. Because she was a Disney Channel teeny bopper. Uh, I don't she know was, if it she was, was the Canadian yeah. version of that. Um, then she put out an album that was uh, that was more dark and brooding, and nobody loved it. And, well, there may, may have been someone who loved it, but definitely no one liked it. And um, after that, she put out Jagged Little Pill, which was widely loved. Monumentally <laughs> loved. Yes. And then, like, and then she became known, mm-hmm. not for the, like, shallow pop that she did before, but for the angry, angsty stuff she did later. Mm-hmm. And now she is sort of sunk down into, not obscurity, because she's still Alanis fucking Morrison, mm-hmm. but her work isn't nearly as popular as it used to be, because now she's a middle-aged woman who's been through some, some shit and recovered from it, mm-hmm. and she writes music about love and commitment and healing yeah. and maturity and not about the douchebag who molested and then dumped her when she was a teenager. So Who may or may not have been yeah. Dave Coulier. And, 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 and I kind of see, like, um, Billie Eilish, the, the woman that did uh, Bad Guy. She has been pushing back against a lot of this commodification. Yeah. And has done so very openly and publicly is like uh, she wears baggy clothes because she does not want to be sexualized. And she is um, at every turn the media has tried to sexualize her. Even that, either that or men have tried to sexualize her. And she's fought back at, at at that at every turn. And in a way, by fighting the potential sexualization of herself, she's also fighting back against the commodification mm-hmm. of herself. And I will say I hope uh, she and Lord and Halsey all have their wonderful mm-hmm. success because we need more we need more pop stars to yeah. stand up for themselves. Yeah. And that's the other reason I finally came around on, I came around on Miley Cyrus was she was standing up for herself. Absolutely. You know, hey, Dead Pets was actually interesting. I wouldn't call it good, but it was, you know, Radio had put out weird for, albums too. And for someone like Miley Cyrus to make something that you would call interesting <laughs> is still an achievement. Yes. So um, to bring this back to everything, though. Yes. Because and it's really interesting that you bring that, that you bring up the like commodification of pop stardom. Mm. Because if the, I think the opposite of objectifying human beings, which mm-hmm. is what's going on in that case, right. is the personification of objects. Right. And that's what's happening in everything. And that's, I think, another reason why I think it's a good thing that there are no, like, visual, interactive humans mm-hmm. in the game. And that's because a human in the game would become an object, whereas the goal of the game is to turn objects into humans. Right. And... When you turn objects into humans, then it becomes a whole lot simpler of a task to treat humans more like humans. Mm -hmm. And that's another reason why it's like, I believe that the goal of this game is at least partly to teach people empathy. Mm -hmm. And I think it does a really good job of that. So everything is is, is an interesting game in the sense that it gives you the opportunity to not only be everything, including God, um, which mm-hmm. is, a, I, I, I kind of, I felt like I'm going through this, like, okay, well, I can be everything. Well, if I can be everything, mm-hmm. I mean, literally everything. Mm-hmm. And then of course I'm able to, uh, destroy cities and, and whatever else I'm able to create. I'm able to create, I can, you know, propagate, I can make things dance. I can make things move. I can make galaxies dance, you know, and I'm not sure if this has come through, although I'm pretty sure it has. Daria has a power fantasy. Yep. And part of that is because Daria uh, has not had a lot of power in her life. Yep. And I like to be able to explore that part of myself. Yeah. In a way that I know isn't going to hurt anyone. Even metaphorically in this case, mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, yeah, you could do, destroy a city, but like, it's not, it's, <laughs> it's not like, it's not like when I was a teenager and I would, I would design a level in Warcraft, not World of Warcraft, mm-hmm. Warcraft, 
old school. I would design a level because and because they they won't let you have a level where where there's no opponent. I would put the the opponent in a little pit without any resources, so they wouldn't be able to do anything. And then I would build this immense society with mm. all the buildings and all the units, and I would <laughs> expand to fill the entire the entire map. And then I would pick one unit and assign him the task of destroying the entire civilization. And just watch him do it. (laughs) (laughs) And and the thing about it is, it's 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 the same reason why a game like Cards Against Humanity exists. Mm -hmm. If we're not willing to take a step back and look at the worst parts of ourselves, and process them, we have a potential to become the worst of ourselves in reality. And I think that's what's happening in this country right now is that there's a generational gap in this country that is caused by a generation that has decided, hey, we need to pull back and look at ourselves and recognize how we can be a terrible society and do something about it versus a generation that has it's outright her- refused to do so. And they think it's heresy. Yes. It's like... They think it's blasphemy. When um, Trump was elected, uh, get your get your groans out. Yeah, yep. I ended up going to a lot of protests. Still go to them, mm-hmm. but er, especially early on, there was this tension at every protest I went to. Two different versions of trying to push against the um, "Make America Great Again" slogan. Mm-hmm. One of them was to say America's already great and it's because of all the things that Trump thinks is bad. Because of the immigrants, mm-hmm. because of the women, because of the religious diversity, right. because of because of uh, the Muslims, because of disabled people, because of all the things that Trump wants you to hate, that's the reason America's already great. Mm-hmm. And then there was the people who were like, America was never great. Because of America has been founded on genocide and war and slavery, Mm -hmm. and those things have not stopped. Right. And there would be these fights in between these two camps. Right. And you and and part of part of me was like, please let's put this difference aside and focus on what what matters. But then Mm -hmm. I realized, no, it does matter. Yeah. It matters a hell of a lot. Whether we realize Mm -hmm. that the way we think and the way that we've been doing things is awful and dangerous and needs to stop. Yes. Or or whether we think, no, we just need to dial this back a few years and go back to how things were when Obama was president. Which isn't that much different. Yeah, it's like... I I mean, we still had Guantanamo Bay. We still had wars. We still had... Mm -hmm. We had bad immigration policies. We had... The, the pay gap, we have, we had, like, you know, oh, cops killing black kids, you know. We still had drone strikes and, and chemical warfare again, against civilians. Against mass shootings. And, yep. I think that there is a renaissance taking place. Mm-hmm. I actually put in my notes that this game is part of a renaissance of video games that's mm-hmm. going on right now. Because I'm seeing more and more video games that are really exploring the capabilities of the medium right. in ways that I see as awe-inspiring, right. frankly. But I think it's also like a renaissance of culture in general. Mm-hmm. And we see like the historical period generally known as the Renaissance wasn't just a time period of like really great paintings. It was also a great time for engineering and science and philosophy and theology that affected every aspect of Mm -hmm. our culture, of European culture at least at the time. And I think that we're going through something like that now, where as we have in every other period of like great cultural reform, Mm -hmm. it comes with a lot of conflict. But ultimately something is emerging. I am excited to see what it is. Yes. So with that said, I think that everything is a game that is worth playing, Mm -hmm. is worth checking out. Um, I realize that for a lot of gamers, this will come off as something not quite what you're used to. And I think it's a different kind of game, yeah. And 
every time I have been thinking about the Gamergate crap or mm. the current uh, war, I guess is probably the the sensationalized term right. for what is going on between the core male gamer community and the games community as a whole. And it is the fact that people are coming into the video game market with different ideas. Yeah. And those people tend to be queer, women, of color, mm -hmm. and so on. Because it's the outsiders who end up coming up with the most revolutionary ideas in any culture. Yeah. And that's not to say that white people can't come up with shit. Yeah. It's just that, historically speaking, white people are too comfortable to come up with shit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's... I mean, there is a reason why uh, country and Western music has basically stagnated. Yeah. <laughs> and part of that definitely has to do with it being co-opted by capitalism. But guess what all has also been co-opted co -opted by capitalism? Mainstream gaming! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, Call of Duty and Madden are like... Capitalism. Yeah. <laughs> That's the main driving force behind those games right now. And I'm not getting on your case for yeah. liking Madden yeah, or Yeah, you can definitely Call of, like Call those Duty. things. But, like, they're not the benchmark of what good games yes. are. And they're, they're certainly not the only kind of games that exist. And the fact that, oh, dear God, Zoe Quinn made a video game about depression. Okay. She made a video game about, about depression. Maybe mm. some people thought that was cool. Yeah. I, I think it's a game worth playing. I do want to warn you, though, that um, if you're used to a goal-oriented gaming style, this may not quite be a game you're okay with. You'll have to come up with your own goals, mm -hmm. um, especially once you get out of the Golden Gate. But I think it's worth your time to at least check out. Yeah, and if it is something that you're resistant to because it's not what you're used to... Mm -hmm. I would encourage you to kind of try to push past that because mm -hmm. ultimately all of the great things in life come from trying things we're not used to. Right. Um, again, that comfort zone. It's really great to spend a lot of your time in, but in ultimately if you want to overcome the desperate boredom of existence, mm -hmm. you're going to need to do something uncomfortable once in a while. Yeah. And it's very relaxing. Oh yeah, it's absolutely very relaxing. Um, and like if if you're into weed, it goes well with weed. Just saying. <laughs> and, and another great thing about this game is you don't even really have to play it. Yeah. You can kind of just sit there and let it play itself. Yeah. Because it will do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a it's a visual it's a visually beautiful and um and musically fascinating and philosophically intriguing game that you can engage with on whatever level you choose to. And that's, like, chances are you can find a way to enjoy it. Right. With that, this has been False Dichotomies. I'm Cy Castells. I'm Daria Quinn, and thank you for spending your time with us. one of my favorite places. It looks really ugly on the screen. I bet it does. Oh, these are going to be lovely bloopers. Absolutely. This is what an outtake sounds like. <laughs>